One quick comment, maybe a couple quick comments. Um, should at the end of lecture, Patrick should be here with the first one book assignment, so you'll get those back. Um, it sounds like people are you know, across the board doing pretty well. Uh, little hand, I haven't seen the meeting of segregation yet, so, but when I do, we'll sort of we'll talk about it. Probably ask some questions right away. And Made it very clear to him that the most important thing is to be fair, right? Like hands down, right? And so if you're worried about why some points came up for this or points came up for that, his main job is to make sure he did that. Just don't give him too hard. Right? Like don't give him too hard a time, right? I mean, make sure you understand the material. That's the main thing. But if you don't understand the material, you know, like, anyway. Uh, so we got to pick up a little bit of material from the last time. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that first. Uh, but the goal today is to get involved in. Discussion and of course working on the board again today uh, to understand spatial organization. Um, and so we were working towards an understanding of the MR signal equation. I'm not sure why it's showing up sort of so dark. Uh, oh, I guess this is my title slide for the lecture I saw. Yeah, that's what's going on. So we still have to get back and, and kind of we, we got most of the way there, maybe three quarters of the way there. We don't even know what to do before we completely understand that expression. And so as you remember, we're working our way through this chain. Excitation, so you're getting some voltage and some coil, and we are right in the middle here of working with the. I think we, we worked through the first phase sensitive detector for the cosine detector, and then we could similarly work through uh, the sine detector, and, and I'll show you how we mix the signals, and then this gets us closer to K space, and again beginning to get an understanding of how the actual signals that we generate and acquire end up filling up this matrix that we call K space, and then of course it ultimately gets us to the final shoulder. So I, I know it was a lot of sort of ground to cover last time, a lot of mathematics and whatnot. So I'll try to kind of go through uh, what we did cover just as a kind of get us on the same page and kind of mentally warm you up if you just consume too much of this sort of thing. Um, and so we started off with Faraday's law of induction. And we, we didn't really get into the details of where this expression on the far right-hand side comes from. I invoked this idea of the principle of reciprocity. But in principle, I want you to have some intuitive understanding of what's going on here. The voltage that we can measure depends on basically our coil sensitivity, the quality of the coil that we design. This is the this is the B field that the receiver is sensitive to. And then we also have the state of the bulk magnetization. We went through a lot of steps to show you and hopefully convince you that there's only certain components of this dot product of this integral that actually end up uh, counting or so uh, we had some different ways of expressing these same things, but when we looked at the uh, uh, defining the coil sensitivity and defining the bulk magnetization, one of the things we saw was that the time rate of change of the Z magnetization looks really kind of close to zero uh, during the time at which we're acquiring and measuring the signal. Right? Relaxation happens on the scale of hundreds of milliseconds. We measure our signal on the scale of a couple milliseconds, so we're many orders of magnitude so under that. Um, we wrote the equation for the transverse magnetization during free precession. Slightly different form, but you should recognize terms, right? What's the initial state of the transverse magnetization at the time we begin to record or measure the magnetization? That will, of course, decay. It always is going to decay during free precession. It has, in this case, the precessional term, which is related to the D0 field. So this is a, an expression that's in the laboratory frame. And then we said we could offset phase from R on that basis from R. And so then we did that. Lots of trigonometry, lots of algebra. And what we ended up with uh, almost near the end of the last lecture was, uh, was an expression that came from this voltage expression that showed us that at the end of the day, the voltage we detect really largely depends on just the transverse magnetization. The Z magnetization does not accompany all this. And there's still the, the B field from the receiver, so the uh, decay terms, and then the processional term and some constant phase terms. So lots of terms. And I think one of the last things I, I indicated was I wouldn't ask you to go through this on the plot, right? But you should be able to identify terms and explain and describe, like, what does that term possibly mean? What does that term mean? Okay, so where are we now? Well, we were in the middle of, of working through this so-called phase-sensitive detector. Uh, and the reason for that was we have this really high-frequency signal, right? It's, it's got a, a lot of terms in it, but it has this really high-frequency term here. And we wanted to understand how we might detect this voltage that we actually care about, because the only voltage we really care about is coming from, say, this, this term here. Uh, do you guys understand right now, or can someone suggest what that term is actually related to? It's not a relaxation term. 
It's not a B0 processional term. So that's a couple things that it's not. So what, is this, what does it say? This says, what is the first term? Omega depends on what? Spatial position, right? And omega is the frequency, right? The processional frequency. So this was a processional frequency at a different, at each spatial location, right? How can we get the processional frequency to be different at, at different locations? Gradient. By a gradient. So this term here, we'll see it, we'll link it up more today, but this term here is actually really important because this is where the spatial frequency information comes from. The spatial encoding is actually pretty important. We have some phase terms, fine. They adjust the phase of the measured signal, and that may or may not matter to us. Uh, what really matters to us in MR is what's the frequency of our signal that, that we're talking that we're talking to say. And so we'll, and that's what's going to link us more directly in the phase space. So pay attention to what's happening with that term. And so the idea is that this is our this this rather big expression now is the voltage that is the input to this phase sensitive detector. The phase sensitive detector is just going to take that input signal, multiply it by a cosine omega naught or sine omega naught term. And that's gonna give us two signal compartments, or two signal terms, a pretty low frequency term and a really high frequency term. And the consequence of that is we can use a low pass filter to get rid of the really high frequency stuff and just keep the lower frequency stuff. And the lower frequency stuff will be the spatial frequency information that we care about. It'll, be a, it'll contain a term that looks like omega as a function of spatial position, spatial encoding information. And the super high spatial, uh, the super high frequency information is not too useful to us, we filter it out and, and we get rid of that. Um, and so I think uh, uh, at the end of the last lecture, we had worked our way through this cosine detected, uh, phase sensitive uh, detected signal, if you will. And so again, uh, by the time we work through these steps, it actually ends up being really a delta omega r. Uh, and and I, I misspoke a little bit. The delta omega r is what tells you about the frequency difference at a particular location. The frequency difference at isocenter would be so then we're just talking about having frequency depend on the spatial position. Um, I'll, I'll look at my notes. I might uh, sort of make a, a, a small decision here uh, that we not work through the steps for coming up with a sine detected term. Uh, I trust in what we did in class, uh, and on this diagram here, you can multiply this signal by a two sine omega zero t. Uh, I'll, I'll probably remind you of what, uh, what trick substitution we need to use to sort of get but the bottom line is you end up with a cosine detected term and a sine detected term. And it may not be obvious why we want to do that. I'll show you mathematically why that's a, an interesting and useful thing in a second. But it's related to being able to detect uh, the handedness of the precession in a magnetization. Not just that it oscillates back and forth, but that it oscillates clockwise or it oscillates around the clock. So that's the whole point of using two phase sensitive. Uh, okay, so when we're done with all of this, what we'll end up doing, and we'll work through some of this today, uh, we're basically going to combine these two phase sensitive detected signals. We'll just say that we have a real and an imaginary input. We're, we're detecting, these are orthogonal functions, sine and cosine orthogonal functions. We're going to detect orthogonal components of the uh, transverse magnetization. Uh, and then we can add them all up, uh, add them together in a complex form, and uh, write down a new expression that gets us a little bit closer to that. Uh, the MR signal equation. Constant term in front, we're still integrating over the object. We're integrating over the object just means we're getting signal from whatever we excited about, right? We don't necessarily know what it is until we've designed a more specific experiment. And so the signal, the, the time-based signal that we receive after the space sensitive detection, after doing the quadrature detection of adding the signals together, just depends on the receiver sensitivity, how good is your coil, what's the state of your transverse magnetization, and in fact, how did you spatially what part, and it will, I'll give you some kind of pictorial examples of what this really means, but this is, allows us to sample magnetization for specific spatial frequencies, and that again gets us closer, uh, and will get us closer to understanding how, how MR does spatial localization and uh, image information. Um, we do by definition, so we'll see here mathematically end up with a delta omega as a function of space. We said just a second ago that we can end up with differences in the Larmor frequency at a spatial position through the application of a gradient. And then by, by substitution, it becomes uh, sometimes convenient to introduce this concept of k-space. And so this is your first, uh, well, maybe not first, it's been in a couple slides, but this is a definition for what is k-space and how k-space 
relates to the applied vagueness of the use. And we'll, again, we'll try to work on some examples of this bit um, here simply. So um, during the next, I guess when I roll up the, the, uh, the board here in a second and, and work with it, our goal is to get towards understanding this expression, and then eventually we'll make a substitution uh, that takes us out of the time domain. Uh, you can see here we have a time domain uh, expression, and we'll put it into the so-called spatial frequency domain. So we'll have an expression that comes up into a space after the previous period of time. So a little overview of where we're headed. There's questions about sort of where we where we stand. Um, that substitution will finally get us into the, the uh, MR signal equation. And there's some, other, there's some other assumptions here, right? You can see some terms are dropping out. And we end up with something that, uh, you know, hopefully it's not, uh, well, it's not as complicated as some of the things we started with, right? And finally, we can say the signal at a K point, all right? So the K vector just means what point in that K space matrix are we talking about, right? We're going to sample these K space points individually. Uh, here, do you think there's a minus? Is that your question? There might be. Uh, which phase? <laughs> I've got a few hanging around. Uh, it's going to show up later. You can't you can't quite see it yet. All we all we're saying right now uh, it, it depends which expression you're pointing to. Let's say we're pointing to this final expression, which is we haven't I haven't shown you exactly how we get there, but this is a summary of how we get there, right? The phase and if you're talking about phase encoding and frequency encoding, yeah, where that shows up is in this k vector, right? The k vector points you tells you which k point are you trying to sample, right? R is a, is, a, is a physical position, what point inside the image. K is the point inside that matrix, right? And through the application of different gradients, we can sample different K points. Yeah. No, um, and lots of things are, and it, and it depends there's two. There's maybe two concepts. There's the phase that the spin system has, and there's the phase that your received s signal has, and those aren't necessarily the same. Why? Well, if we go up to this voltage expression up here, we have some some phase constants, right? We said this was the phase from the exciter, right? So there's phase coming from the RF pulse, and that gets added to the bulk magnetization, right? We have some phase. Uh, this must be the phase from the receiver system. Uh, yep. So we also have some phase that's possible from the coil receiving system. So it's not really in the bulk magnetization, but it ends up in our signal because our coil adds some phase to that signal. You see that, uh, depending on sort of your mathematical familiarity, you see it some in this term here. Right? That the, the coil sensitivity is complex value. It can, it can color the magnitude of the signal you receive, and it can color the phase of the signal. Good questions. Okay, so I don't, you know, based on this, this was meant to be the overview. We still have to walk through a couple of these steps to make sure that we're sort of following conceptually uh, and mathematically how we got there. But our goal, maybe in the next 10 or 15 minutes, is to get to uh, being able to write down this expression here at the top, which I think is one of the most kind of critical of all expressions. There's a question the, uh, for the definition of case space, this expression. Yeah. The second, is it actually the yeah, uh, ooh, wow, geez. Uh, yep. And should we just do it absolutely? Yeah, this is not, a, this is, I don't know why. I, I, it, it's correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, K equals to GRT. Oh, the other T. Yeah, so it should yeah. be T in the middle. Yeah. It's not quite. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and that, make, that should make sense to us. What matters is not just the gradient strength, but it's basically its duration as well. Yes, right. Sure. And that's going to that's gonna tell you which point in K-space you can get it down to, right? There's a lot of latex code behind all these equations, sorry. There should be a T. Hmm? There should be a T. There should be a T. And in fact, I mean, there's I gave you an even more elegant expression of this earlier, which related uh, 
case space to actually the integral of the gradient waveform. Right, so that's what it, that's what it really sort of links back to. If you just think of gradients not being functions of time, but just being turned on or with the T, then this is an acceptable construction. More generally, the gradient waveform isn't just on; it could have any arbitrary shape, and then where you are in case space could be arbitrary and be subject to case space. Okay, so uh, I think I'm gonna I might run through a few slides and then and then work through th a few things on the board. Uh, we worked through the cosine phase sensitive detected signal. We didn't work through the sine uh, detected uh, signal. And then uh, we'll explain here, at least uh, mathematically, how we get to a time based uh, complex audience signal. Uh, so I'll, I think there's two or three slides I'll work through, and then I'll, then I'll pull up the board to see what I can find on the board to move those. Uh, the last step after you've done this, the two phase sensitive, run your voltage signal to, through the two phase sensitive detectors, is just to mix the signal. And that just means you're going to add up their complex sum. I'll show you that on the board in a second. Uh, the next step after you have a, a time-based complex valued signal is to go to a case-based valued signal. That's where we want to end up. We don't really care so much what, hap what happens as a function of time. We, we care what, hap what happens at specific spatial frequencies. And so working through this diagram again, then we end up sort of needing to make a substitution here uh, that allows us to relate you know, where we are in time, meaning through the duration of some applied gradient, for example, and then what k point we were actually using it. So this is where you can see the time should have shown up in the previous slide, and you see it showing up here. And that's just as basically a substitution that lets us get into uh, that uh, into that k space valued signal. The difference here, uh, the top expression is if you're thinking of an FID signal. So an FID signal uh, is is an asymmetric signal has a large amplitude and then it decays, and so we don't. Talk about things from time equal to zero. For an echo-based signal, whether it's a gradient echo or a spin echo sequence, uh, then we uh, then it's useful to recenter things based on the echo time and not the echo time. So that's just okay. So then I think yeah. So let me pull up the board and then we'll come back and talk about uh, some of the specifics from that uh, signal Questions before we get going? You're going back to. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find that. In the middle of the equation, yes. This, so hang on, just one second. You're talking specifically about this. Yes, I think okay. the only like a key because G is a function of time, so it's it, 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 it integral. Yeah, and so what I said just a second ago is that there's a more formal expression for this, in which case we say K. Itself is equal to, geez, if I can do this in my head, right? So it's um, it's going to be, I think it's gamma by two pi, the integral from zero to t, g vector t, right? Now, in the simple case, when your gradient waveform, this is what I was saying just you know, a couple minutes ago, if we have a gradient waveform and it's just on. And at this point in time, uh, for a box-like function, it, it simplified this expression. Uh, just to be equal to some gradient of amplitude, right, times uh, some tau, some atomic time of the applied gradient. So in this, what's that? So then we have the R uh, and the R is So okay. So that's all I did, and I'm sorry that the time value for all this was so bad. It's not as good as it might be. But no, 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 it's good. I, I'm not trying to. Trust me. I spend. I spend a, well. So for this lecture, just so you guys know, right, for reference, uh, this lecture I've probably spent close to 20 or 30 hours. And this is still what's wrong with me, right? Like there's still things, uh, and it's not because I don't 
<laughs> okay, uh, so now I'm going to roll up the board, uh, and hopefully we can uh, make some progress. Let's find where we were. Let's see. Um, did we number, or sorry, letter our equations last time? Do you guys have an equation B? Yeah. And then we didn't get to equation E, which would have been the cosine detected signal. Uh, was it a sine detected signal? So we didn't actually write that out, but it should be in your notes right now, right? Yeah. Those numbers that, just, that I just gave you. Okay. Uh, so all I'm going so to say, you have those two expressions there. So without working through the algebra of the second phase sensitive detection signal. So our goal was to get towards having a, a complex, uh, 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 doing what's called the quadrature detection, whereby we combine the two phase sensitive detected signals. So uh, we have some signal as a function of time. Uh, we're going to combine those two detectors. Once, it, it, this is one way to think about it. We had a sine detector and a cosine detector. Our magnetization is actually precessing the round, right? The sine detector has you looking up at the signal, and it's oscillating back and forth, say, this way. Cosine detector has you looking at the signal the other way and picking up the oscillation in the other dimension, if you will. So there's two or thought, there's two components to that oscillation because it's a precession in that transverse plane. All I want to do now is combine those two signals that we use, that we got from the phase sensitive detectors. So we have, say, a real component um, uh, to that signal, which is a function of time. And we're just going to add it to the complex value. So this first term, for example, we can pick up from our two cosine omega zero t detectors. And the second term here, we can pick up from the two sine omega t detectors. So what does that mean? Well, we can write a compound expression that involves both of those space sensitive uh, detected signals. We have something like S of t is equal to omega 0 times the integral over the algebra. That's going to pick up the magnitude of our B receiver field, which can be a function of space, but it's a constant, so it's not a function of time per se. It still involves the magnitude of our transverse magnitude. Times. Now we had some phase terms which we can exponentiate using Euler's expression. So it ends up looking like e to the minus pi times a big phase term. So something like delta omega, which is a function of space. This is our spatial frequency encoding field. Minus the phi from the RF, which could be a function of space depending on how well your transit coil works. Plus some phase from the receiver, which also color the phase of your measured signal, and your receiver systems are colored. And we had this slightly clumsy pi over 2 term, uh, which was just uh, the gradient of the phase of the signal. So this is after having combined the two phase sensitive detected signals, that's all. Um, we'd like to sort of pack this down a little bit, and uh, what we're going to try to, what I'm going to sort of do now is just show you that there's another way. This is a magnitude phase, but this magnitude term also has a phase term associated with it. And we have another magnitude term, and this magnitude term also has 
phase term associated with it. And so we're just going to try to pack this down into uh, uh, everything used in an Euler-like notation. Uh, to do that, we want to remember that mxy, uh, which is a function of space, is just the magnitude of mxy uh, of space time times some phase. And in this case, the phase that we're picking up into the into the magnetization is this is actually the, the phase uh, store, or this is a description of the transverse magnetization. It has some magnitude and it can pick up some phase. The bulk magnetization itself will pick up phase, in this case from the receiver coil or from the RF coil. So we have EV high phi uh, EV high which can be a function of space. Um, we can also write something for our B receiver field, which looks like R uh, x y, which is a function over space. And we want to write this in a more compact Euler's notation, but we can still write its magnitude, which is b r x y, which again is over space. Uh, and the phase term uh, looks like a, a dot b e to the minus uh, i phi uh, receiver phase, which is a function of space. And I missed something there is that this is actually the complex conjugate. Okay. Why? Well, I have a pod, I have a minus receiver phase there, uh, and so I need to still end up with a minus in my Euler expression. If you're not familiar with the uh, complex conjugate, then we can t think of the phase of the magnetization, or rather any complex phase, that lies in the x, y, say, real or imaginary plane. It has some phase associated with it here. That's the phase. Complex conjugate of that phase just lies down in some reflective boundary here on the axis. The only reason we have to take the complex conjugate is based on the sign of the phases that we have in the exponential nature of the field. It just lets us write it down. Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't say. A, it doesn't eliminate it, right? It's changing the sign of it. So what happened here? We had a. Um, we're just tr all I'm trying to do is collect terms, right? So that rather than writing the sort of magnitude and phase terms each time, we can just say we have transverse magnetization that we recognize as potentially complex phi, and we have the E receiver. Uh, so what does that let what does that let us do? Well, it's really just a way of, of making this time-based function slightly easier to write. And so we can write it as S of t is equal to still omega zero in the plane. We have a constant term, right? We've been carrying it around for a while. This e to the and then there's the pi over two term there. Uh, taking together the two minus signs, we can pull it out in front. And e to the should just be So it's just a constant. Lots of you'll see. There's a lot of scaling terms. We'll talk about the scaling terms in a second, but scaling terms aren't terribly important for this. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why in a second. We still have the integral over the object, but now we can write it down in slightly more uh, compact form, which is just to say it's b r complex conjugate of the receiver phase as a function of space uh, times whatever our initial condition. And then we're still left with a spatial frequency encoding term, which looks like it's e to the minus i uh, delta uh, lambda cosine theta. So we need to write it down as cosine theta plus lambda. Uh, so we're getting there, right? What, what, have, what have we accomplished at this point? We've just said that our time-based signal has a slightly more compact uh, term or a phrase. Again, magnitudes we don't really care about too much in MR. We don't have sort of an absolute measurement scale, unfortunately. There's several reasons for that. Um, we could look at this again and say, well, what about our B receiver field uh, term here? 
uh, what would the what would the best coil look like? What would that become if you had sort of a perfect coil? It would be constant. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a function of space. Right. What about its magnitude and what about its phase? I mean, you're you're on the right track by saying constant. I'm just trying to get into the negative. Yeah, so we want a constant, you want a constant over space, right? So constant over space, constant over time. The magnitude itself doesn't really matter too much. In principle, you want a large B because that'll be the most sensitive detector, but there'll be some electronic noise in the uh, B. Uh, and so, you know, there are circumstances where that could be, sorry, I should write it here. There are circumstances where we may just drop that term just simply to focus on understanding what's happening in the transverse magnetization and how is it encoded. And you have to really go back to the beginning of where this derivation started to, to appreciate um, you know, how this imparts a spatial encoding. We'll get into this with some examples in just a, uh, in just a second. It's, it's, not that, it's not that omega r is constant uh, over uh, sort of any period of time. It's that omega 0 is, right? And so the, the omega uh, r that we have is equal to omega 0 plus omega space. This here. Yeah. yeah. This here. Yeah, just the end of the line. Because there's a yeah, there's a uh, uh, <coughs> I don't think so, but no one. No. Yeah. So you're right. I did I didn't uh, I didn't explain that very carefully. So if, if you go back to your say cosine and uh, thank you for pointing this out. If you go back to your cosine or sign detected signals, uh, uh, when we were done, we had an omega r term here, right? And that's how, that's how the expressions were left, right? So uh, to first approximation, omega r and omega 0 are the same, right? So come back over to this expression here. Uh, that doesn't make any sense the way I wrote it, right? It's all right. So how does how does omega r compare to omega zero? Are they close or not very close? They're pretty close, right? And so we can carry out the omega r in front as a constant, but we still leave behind the delta. Right? We still need that difference term, but the constant part. Is that just holding? You're, you're focusing on here. You're fo I mean, this term here says you're fo focusing on the difference relative to the long term horizon, relative to omega zero. Yeah. Yeah. That expression should be like that. Just moving the other digits. Say, say it again. There should not be the other term. It should only be a gradient with the omega zero. Right. Because the gradient takes the case of in the case that the gradient implies the R factor. No, it should not be R, yeah. No R. Yeah, no, you're right. There's no R for that. The R is in the lab. Yeah, it's just related to the, the, the time yeah. interval between the three and four. So R needs to be in the lab. It takes all the R. Because the those points are not. Uh, I mean, in the lab of the equation, it should be k plus the dot after bigger than k. Yeah. 
for the key itself, it's just not capturing things as they are in the heart. Okay, let's leave it for now. We're going to get too hung up on these. No, I mean, I, I'm not trying to do something wrong here, right? But it's, it is, you guys can take your turn at some point if you want to. But <laughs> okay. So where were we? We're at this expression here, right? Just saying that we have a way of doing what's called the quadrature detection, combining the real and imaginary signals to get a time-based signal that arguably is simpler than some of the things that we saw. Yeah? So this term here is really just a scaling term, right? We'll talk about this in a little So we have a scaling term there, but we don't necessarily care about scaling terms too much. This term here, again, it depends on how good is your receiver system, right? It's possible that this won't be, you know, maybe a function of space. Uh, it might be uniform. It might be an absolute constant. So we can have an even simpler expression in that case and just write. Leaving out the D receiver field term. Yes. Our uh, initial magnetization is just E to the minus pi delta L R. <coughs> so you'll re you should be able to recognize that as a complex valued signal. It depends on the state of the transverse magnetization at the tunnel plus the exponential term there. Um, we carry where it, so this is the time-based signal that we actually detect. We haven't gotten to the case-based version of this signal quite yet. It'll, it'll show up shortly. Uh, in this signal that we detect here, where is the contrast information right now? We're talking part of what we want to understand is image contrast, right? Where is the image contrast information stored in, in that expression? It's just in the MXY term. It's whatever we've done prior to this to generate this initial condition. Saturation pulses, inversion pulses, green echo, spin echo, any combination of those things, right? So then what's left is a second term here, which we're beginning to understand is related to spatial frequency encoding. We're going to take uh, sort of what's happening physically is you're taking the state of your prepared magnetization, whatever you've done to that magnetization, multiplying by a spatially varying uh, signal, right? It varies as a function of space. And this will help us evaluate how much of this, this is a spatial frequency term, how much of this spatial frequency is present in the underlying object here? I'll show you an example in just a second. And this is this is what the this is the principle of MR. We'll get to the well, let me get to the K the case based base signal with one more step, and then uh, uh, then we can talk a little bit more about uh, spatial frequency encoding. So what we really want to do from uh, this signal here is go from the S of T based signal to an S to the K based signal. And the question is, in part, how do we do that? So I'm going to clean up uh, sort of this left hand side, just leave that stuff up now. Uh, the decay term we left out earlier. Um, the reason we can leave it out is under the assumption that the, that the, the, yeah, that the duration during which we're measuring the signal is short. And that's true of most MR experiments. We sample the magnetization. We're talking about measuring and sampling the magnetization. We measure and sample the magnetization maybe for a millisecond, maybe for as long as five or even ten milliseconds. That pop up on the bar. Yeah, yeah. So again, it depends on the experiment that you're trying to do. So then you have to get into like ultra short echo time signals. We'll actually come back and reevaluate that effect, right? What it means is that uh, we dropped, we, it didn't show up in these slides, we did that in the last lecture, but if you think about uh, case space, uh, if this is, say, the kx dimension and this is the ky dimension, as I'm reading out of this dimension, I'm getting my echo, my echo forms, right? This is a little bit of bad communication, I believe that was ky, right? If I have no t2 decay or no t2 star decay during the acquisition, that's an okay assumption if my readout is short and my T2 is very long. 
if I do have T2 decay, uh, then I then I have to I would effectively be multiplying that signal by decaying expansion, right? And so it's a little it's a little hard for me to draw, right? Uh, if my you know it's hard for me to multiply that by <laughs> a decaying exponential on the board in my head, right? But you would effectively end up with uh, let's say the signal is stronger on this side for some reason. So you would keep it strong on that on that side, but it would be decaying until you succeed on the way given by the time you got to the end of the game. That has an effect that we'll talk about later. It affects actually your spatial resolution. And so getting high spatial resolution and things like the, the things that do short T2 is an extra thing. Okay, so I'm gonna leave just that top expression there, and then we're just gonna work quickly to understand this. I'll come back to the slides and look at some you know, uh, qualitative examples. So uh, let's consider a B field that varies over space, right? So we have B as some function of R. This is what I was close to what I was writing uh, earlier. And then we have the background B0 field for everything that we're talking about in this class, plus the potential for some delta B, right? Which may be a function of space. Um, we know we can generate these field and homogeneities uh, in the presence of the B0 field just by adding a gradient. Turn on some gradient, and the field it generates depends on spatial position. How far away are you from the ISO center? The most simple expression that we've been uh, working with several times is just the Larmor expression, which says the frequency we have, the Larmor frequency omega zero, is equal to gamma b zero. Now we have a slightly different magnetic field, uh, but we can calculate, for example, the frequency offset delta. just gamma times the gradient times the spatial position. So here we've just taken out the B0 term and we talk about the frequency difference at a particular point in space. And we're trying to touch on that earlier. So what does that let us do? Well, it lets us go back to this expression here and say, okay, well, we understand something about what delta omega can be. Delta omega is related to the gradients that we've drawn. So we'll come back to this expression and say S of t is equal Integral of the alpha, uh, mxy, uh, which is varying over space but not far. And now we just make the substitution and say d is minus i, and we know that it's gamma times g times r uh, omega. Uh, it probably should be. So we saw some case-based definitions earlier. Uh, there were slightly different forms for the same thing. Uh, but we can say that our k vector, where we are, what, what location we have in k-space, is the two-dimensional space, so we can think of it as a vector. That's just equal to a gamma by the gradient strength times i. Um, different ways to express that if we want to. We can say it's also 2 pi right, times your k vector. So it depends on the amplitude and the duration of the applied gradient tells you about where you're going to end up in k space, right? what k point you're actually talking about uh, after some period of time has elapsed. So what does that let us do? Well, just by substitution, we can say now that s k is equal to the integral over the offset of our transverse magnetization, mxy of space but not time for this now increasingly simplified situation times e to the minus i p pi k 
that I did over the past year. Same uh, vector times R vector. So this is an expression I want to talk about for a second and then show you some examples uh, so that you begin to have some, some concept of what's going on. So let's think about a particular K point. Right? We're at some point in K space. And through all of this detection methodology, we're sampling the signal <coughs> at a particular K point. What is our signal at a K point? Right? The signal at a K point depends on integrating all of the information coming out of whatever we excited. Coils don't measure pixel things. They just measure whatever's excited, right? What we excited depends on the state of the transverse magnetization. And what's, a, what's available for detection in our image depends on the state of the transverse magnetization as it's multiplied by this unusual looking spatial frequency uh, pattern, right? We're gonna look carefully at what this term really means or what it really looks like. It depends on K. I know it's a little crowded in there. Is it too crowded for me? So it depends on k vector, it depends on uh, r vector. This whole term right here uh, is basically, obvious. It's, it's multiplying onto the state of the transverse magnetization and, and allowing you to estimate how much of this pattern is found in your object. Right? This is going to represent different banding patterns in an image, basically. And any image can be comprised of the appropriate sum of all of these different banding patterns, which we call the Fourier coefficients. So by, and this is kind of the magic of MR, I mean this is what Lauterberg basically got his Nobel Prize for, recognizing that if you take the state of the transverse magnetization, apply some gradients, uh, and by applying gradients, sample a particular spatial frequency, you can evaluate this complex value function at a particular K point. And now you just have to get all your K points so that you can, after a Fourier transform, come back and have that function. So keep that expression in mind, and I'm going to show you some Graphical examples of what this really sort of looks like. No? So let's flip this back. Okay. So this, this expression here, I'll show you even some MATLAB code for this in just a second. This is the spatial frequency encoding term, right? This is, the, this is sort of the magic to how we could possibly do spatial frequency encoding. Uh, each one of these is potentially a function. It depends on k, right? k depends on what is the exact, what's the applied gradient at a particular point in time and how long it's been applied for. And then it's mapped over all points in space. So what we were interested in doing is estimating our s of k's. If we can sample all of our S of Ks, fill up K space, then we're one step away, a Fourier transform away from having the image. So let's think about what these, what these uh, spatial frequency terms actually look like. Well, the middle of space here, right, uh, our uh, gradient would not have been turned on yet. So we would just have an E to the I, 2 pi, 0 for all spatial positions. And we would get something very, very flat. Right? It would just be 0, right, or some amplitude. If you go out to other points in k-space, this function here will represent basically different banding patterns. And as you move out further and further in k-space, you're going to what we call higher spatial frequencies. So this would be an intermediate spatial frequency, and this would be a high spatial frequency. If I move to a k-point that's on the other axis, then I'm looking at a spatial frequency pattern that's perpendicular to the one along, say, the x-axis. So comparing this spatial frequency pattern to this spatial frequency. Every time the, the gradients move us through k-space, they move us to a point in k-space, that pattern is exerted onto our magnetization by the applied gradients, and it basically, ask, we're asking the question, how much of that pattern is found in my object? If I have a lot of that pattern in my object, I have a lot of that pattern in my object, what about this pattern over there? And so every point in k-space, this is a very high resolution k matrix, but every individual point in k-space tells me about the presence or absence of one of these patterns. And any object can be comprised of the appropriate sum of all of these different spatial frequency patterns. If I get really high spatial frequency information like this, I also have higher resolution information. Right? But that costs me time. If I want to get all of my high spatial frequencies out here, I have to spend time in doing that. 
can't always afford to take those high altitude flights. There's also some signal to noise uh, sort of advantage, disadvantage to stealth if you're able to get a deeper position. Uh, if you want to look at this from a MATLAB perspective, it's not so bad. Uh, we have to define our tyro magnetic ratio, we define a gradient strength, we define some time step, and then we can just define our KXs. Which KX do we want to talk about? Depends on what, how far, what the, what's the gradient amplitude, and for how long is that gradient going to fly? Uh, we can create a grid of spatial positions, and then we can just exponentiate that grid of spatial positions multiplied by the spatial frequency pattern that you're trying to evaluate. So we can pick a specific kx, pick a specific ky, and evaluate these functions over sort of the whole field of view, the whole space that we care about. And then this is just plotting some of those functions. And so you get something like this. So for a given gradient amplitude, for a given delta t, you'll map out some spatial frequency pattern. You can look at its, you can look at its real component, you can look at its imaginary component, you can look at its magnitude, and you can look at when we plot things, when we look at these k-space diagrams that I keep showing you, we're really just showing the, the magnitude k-space, right? There is a phase component to k-space as well. We won't really touch on it too much in this class. We're mostly in regard to just the magnitude. Uh, but I want you to have kind of a real-world understanding of how you could generate these Fourier sampling functions just by knowing something about what type of gradient is possible. You can generate all these different patterns that would, that would be useful, and in fact, I think one of your homework problems will be basically writing it discrete Fourier transform using these you know, spatial frequency and phase parameters. Okay, so, so where are we? Well, let's back up a little bit. We have an object, right? We're trying to image something, someone's head. And we know pretty well now how to generate different states of the transverse magnetization, right? What's the, what, is this, uh, what does the imaging experiment do now? It takes the state of the transverse magnetization and by applying a, range, a, a series of gradients, will allow us to evaluate the presence or absence of this particular spatial frequency pattern. All right, the one that I'm showing in the background is one possibility, but there's hundreds, right? And multiplying my magnetization by some sampling function, and then whatever comes into my receiver is what I have. So I'm integrating over that whole object. I just get whatever my receiver picks up, right? It's everything in the whole slice. So it's the presence or absence of that spatial frequency pattern in the entire object, right? We don't measure image pixel intensities. We spatial frequency intensities. And that tells me specifically about the value, the, the amplitude, say, of, at a particular k point. So my job, your job, is to move around the different k points uh, such that you fill up your entire k matrix. That particular k point maybe represents, you know, minus kx something and plus ky something. And s of k is just the amplitude for that particular k point. Again, your job is moving around through all the different k points we need, estimating all of their amplitudes. And so S of k is you know, maybe relatively high in amplitude for that particular k point. It's really high in amplitude for some middle k point, and it's pretty low in amplitude for some middle k point. The last step then is once you've filled up all of k space by having gone and visited and sampled all the different spatial frequency patterns, fill up this entire array, and subsequently can obtain a Fourier transform. Or so after a Fourier transform, we can come back to getting the image of the object that we're trying to do. So conceptually, that's what's going on. Mathematically, we sort of see it here. The idea that this is exactly re related through an FFT, uh, we'll pick up on that in a little bit. Yeah? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I mean, by, by definition at least, when we, when we look at maps of k-space like this, we put the low spatial frequency stuff in the middle, okay? So this isn't exactly a question yet, but let me just get people oriented. So the middle uh, spatial, uh, sorry, the lowest spatial frequency stuff here is in the middle. And this, at the lowest, uh, say the k0 point, right at the origin, it's only telling us about how much magnetization do we have, right, because it's integrating not a spatial, not exactly a spatial frequency pattern, but a very flat pattern. How much magnetization do I have available to me in that object, right? As we go further out in k-space, out to these other points in k-space, we're getting out to, uh, uh, say, higher and higher frequency patterns, right? 
resolution, high resolution imaging requires lots of high frequency information, right? So if I want to resolve small and fine details in my object, I have to be able to evaluate the presence or absence of really fine structures like this. Now remember, it's not just this spatial frequency here with this pattern, but I also have to look at this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, until I get up here, and now I'm looking at some funny high frequency but diagonal pattern, right? I have to get all of those if I want to get kind of the whole object. I'll show you some examples. We'll, we'll have kind of a, a lecture that's, that's even more about case space. Uh, but if I have a, for example, let's say this is my case space, right? And let's say there's a point maybe right here that has a very, very high value, right? It's as bright as the center case space information here, but it's, it's out here and it's very, very bright. What's that gonna do to my image? What do you think you would see in your image? Not blurring. Yeah, so, no, that's a good guess. If you just have one single point that's really, really high in amplitude, it means that one of these patterns is, is heavily overrepresented, right? So let's say it's this point over here, and for some reason it's a thousand times the value that it is right now. That means that this particular pattern is gonna be very overrepresented in my object. So I'll see a picture of a brain, but I'll see this banding pattern. I'll show you a nice example of that. It's probably in the next lecture. So it's really helpful in MR if you have some understanding of uh, if something happens in case space, what happens to my image? Because when you're sitting at the MR scanner, you're going to end up with an image that you don't like, and you have to think conceptually back to what possibly could have caused this. Now, the big challenge in a lot of MR is that lots of similar, lots of very different things can cause very similar artifacts. So then you're left. Okay, so pushing through this, this, this one, pull off, come back to this. Okay, uh, let's go through this and then we'll take a quick break. But I think probably you've got most of this at this point. Uh, you know that spin echo and gradient echo images, uh, gradient echo imaging controls the image contrast. Specifically, we talk about defining it like at the echo point. We'll talk later about this T2 star weighting effect. Uh, you have some appreciation now for how gradients move us through case space. Uh, we saw it as one of the last expressions on the board, but the relationship between the gradients and the case space itself is pretty cool. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about calculating scan time. How long does it take you to get a single echo uh, as your TR, typically? And then how many echoes do you need once you understand your scan time? And the scan time can easily become you know, minutes. And so that's one of the big challenges for uh, we talked today already about the concept of coil sensitivity, right? That beam receiver term. It can color the amplitude or the intensity of our images, and it can color the phase of our images. We want perfect coils. At the very, very end, the last MR signal expression I showed you, we drop the beam receiver, receiver term out completely, and we said, well, let's assume we have the perfect coil. Not a, not a great assumption, but mathematically it gives us something that's easier to talk about. Um, we did see through all of this uh, why MRI is not directly sensitive to MZ. Do you remember what it was that really led us to understand that? We had a series, we went work through a series of expressions, but it really came down to the flux is related to the time rate of change of MX, MY, MZ. And the time rate of change of MZ is really slow and almost constant relative to MX and MY. MX and MY are zipping around at 64 megahertz. MZ is just slowly crawling up. So we don't know what's happening. Um, we worked through mathematically the role of phase sensitive detection, uh, and in fact, quadrature detection, so that we could actually sample the transverse magnetization, get rid of the carrier frequency and the larmer frequency information, and just look at it in, in a simpler form, and, and also be able to detect where the transverse magnetization is in the complex plane. Uh, and then finally, we went through various forms of this, but you should be able to define the MR signal equation and have some, you know, be able to say and describe something about each of those terms. What are those terms proxies for? What do they tell us about the hardware and the state of the magnetization and so on? Okay, so that was a, that was a long lecture nine. Questions about sort of where we landed? Okay, so let's take a you know kind of five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll actually get started with today's lecture. <laughs>
is going to be great. I mean, I hope so. I mean, so I, I think my last email to her said was kind of like two words ago, and it's like, okay, just move. I don't remember the exact word, but just ask me if I can help. Okay. Who's who kind of works in this field a little bit? So I went to work with my dear friend, who's working in the field. So I thought that kind of was just a tease. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's do it right after class, just so we can try to let some people have four o'clock class and then work from there. But I'm, I mean, the questions are always great. Okay, so we're working on getting more and more insight as to how we actually do this spatial localization. And what we, what we just understood, hopefully, is how gradients can help us move around cool space and sample these different cake points. And that's related to spatial localization, but it's not the whole picture, and there's, of course, more we can say about it. Uh, learning objectives, we'll come back to these in the next lecture. So there's really three important steps to spatial localization. The first thing is slice selection, right? When we excite spins, we have to excite the slice that we care to image. Now, in principle, you can also excite volumes and do true three-dimensional imaging. We'll keep it simple for today, certainly, and only talk about slice selection. We have to pick a slice. Once you've excited a slice, there's two dimensions of information we still have to get. We can call them different things, but we have to get two more dimensions, right? So in principle, you can think about trying to get the information that provides you uh, pixel intensity information on an x and y direction or something like that. But we've sort of seen now, we don't actually measure pixel intensities, right? Not in image space. We measure signal intensities in the Fourier space, in K space. So we have to figure out a way to move around in two dimensions. And we do that through a process called phase encoding and through a, pro a process called frequency encoding. We've actually seen something about frequency encoding already. This showed up in the gradient echo lecture, for example. Uh, we didn't really call it frequency encoding at that point. We only thought of it in terms of forming the gradient echo. But it has uh, the purpose of also allowing us to do so-called frequency encoding. So bottom line, there's three critical steps here to doing Spatial encoding. This is what a simple and relatively typical pulse sequence would look like. This is, in fact, a gradient echo sequence. And it's going to start off uh, with two things at the same time. We're going to have a V1 pulse or an RF pulse at the same time that we have an applied field gradient. Right? It's those two things together that are required to achieve slice selection. There's better or worse ways to do it, but you have to play an RF pulse 
while you're also playing your gradients. And in fact, it's one of the only times that we'll play RF pulses and gradients at the same time, is to excite spins at a specific uh, spatial location. We'll talk today some about why we also play this last gradient here. This last gradient here is called a slice, this is the slice select gradient. This is called a slice select rewinder. It actually helps us boost our signal to noise and it's, it's handy. I'll show you why, sort of where that comes from. And then, while we may not understand all the, all the sort of mathematics of it yet, the two other steps are called phase encoding and frequency encoding. And it's those two steps together, additional gradient waveforms uh, in both cases, allow us to move through case space, get all the case points, and then uh, be that close to getting an actual uh, image encoder that we uh, require. So I mostly said this already. There's three components, three essential components to the slice selection process. We have a slice selection gradient. That's typically of constant magnitude. Turn the gradient on slightly later time, turn the gradient off. We have to have a B1 pulse or an RF pulse. And that RF pulse has to contain frequencies. We talked about the envelope function. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about this today. Uh, but the B1 pulse has to contain frequencies matched to the slice of interest. Right? When I turn on a gradient, I have high frequencies in my head. I have low frequencies towards my foot. I need to have an RF pulse that's matched to the slice that I care about. It has to be higher in frequency to get this slice. It has to be lower in frequency to get this slice. And then the third component was what I said just a second ago, that slice select rephasing gradient. And that's going to ultimately help us boost the signal to noise a little bit. It has the effect of, of, of helping us rephase some spins. So I'll show you that effect in simulation. And then uh, if we get to it today, we'll see it in the mathematics as well. Uh, and the whole point here of slice selection is to permit us to excite just the slice that we care about. Uh, so this is what the process looks like together. This is just pulled out from the previous one. So uh, I don't think I have to talk through that in any further specifics. So here we just take a, a simple example. We saw this in part when we were talking about the gradient lecture, right? We understand when it's just the B0 field that everything's just going to process at the same Lama frequency. So this all looks like we would expect. We just have omega equals gamma B0. We can turn on a gradient. Now I can turn on a gradient. And when I turn on a gradient, I can have a slightly larger field at the head, slightly lower field at the foot. And as a consequence, get a linear variation in the field and get a linear variation in the frequency. So there's a connection between spatial position and frequency. Right? You can see this in this kind of mathematics that we just saw. Um, I'm not sure why this is showing up again, except for maybe to emphasize that there's this slice select gradient on the very end, or this refocusing gradient on the very end, which helps us get back some of our magnetization. So here's the actual process of excitation. I'll, I'll go through this probably twice. What you're seeing on the left-hand side is two things. You have a series of spins distributed along the z-direction. And then in this little subset over here, this little sub-movie over here, you're actually looking down the axis of the spins. Okay? So you're looking at what's happening to the transverse magnetization. So during the process of excitation, there'll be a, a bunch of spins relatively in the middle here that are oscillating and begin to tip down into the transverse plane. But they're also being forced to be phased by that same gradient. This rephasing gradient here will pull all the phase back out of these spins, and they'll all be pointed in the same direction, like so. So let me let me get this to the uh, very end. Let's see. How do you know how big or like how long the uh, how do you know like the magnitude of the gradient in the in the rephasing? Yeah, you'll see that a little bit uh, late. I, I, Again, I'm not sure if we'll get there today, but you'll see that there's this phase term that we're left with at the end. And it's a phase as a function of space. And, and that's, that's as a consequence of the application of the RF and the gradient. And we can, we can, we can uh, know how much phase is applied to the spins during that process. And then we can undo that phase with this last gradient. What it, what it comes down to in the end is from the middle of the echo. So this is the peak of our echo here. We have half the readout gradient. There's an area that's here. This rephasing gradient has to be equal in area to half the readout gradient. That's what it ends up being. So the rephasing gradient has to be equal to three percent. Yep. The re this rephasing gradient here, the yeah. area of it, it has to be equal to half the area of the readout gradient. Okay. The reason for that has to do with. Let me let me see if I can start this over again. I know it goes through a bunch of stuff here. But so 
watch what happens to the state of my spins right at the peak of the echo. They're hardly, they're just barely in the transverse plane. They're there now, right? And they're really defased, right? At the end of excitation, this only this gradient here will cause these spins to rephase. There's no more RF, and now they're all being pulled back into phase. What does that mean when they're all back in phase? It means the spins that I care about, the ones in the middle of this sort of spatial extent, they've been tipped over by 90 degrees in this case, and they're also all pointing in the same direction. At the end. At the end, yeah. And so now they're all doing that at the end to have some coherent, organized magnetization, and now I can do the rest of my experiments, my phase encoding, my frequency encoding, sample my magnetization. I see. And it's critical that the, that the uh, peak of the um, RF part was in the same plane as the pulses of the Yeah, I mean, for the RF pulses that we'll talk about in this case, that'll all, in this class, that'll always be the case. Okay. So we'll have a constant, we'll have a constant uh, uh, amplitude gradient, and we'll have symmetric RF pulses. So the middle, the, the, the maximum will always occur at the middle. There's a whole sort of, I mean, there's there's a lot you can learn about RF pulse design. We won't really get into yeah, that too much. Maximum occurring in the middle. The middle here, yeah. this maximum, yeah. yeah. So this is this says we want to use the the maximum p1 amplitude at this point in time. Yeah. So our maximum p1 amplitude at that point in time uh, will help us excite the slice that we're interested in exciting. I don't know if that's exactly. Yeah, that's the maximum. Okay. Yeah. So before the maximum, is there a phase uh, that you point to in the different directions? Is there a location along the peaks? Well. So it's the, the phase is poorly defined. When the spins are pointing straight up, the phase is poorly defined. If they're pointing exactly up, I can't define the phase. So it's only until they're a little bit off axis that I can start talking about phase. But now, as a function of space, because of my gradient, they're all at different frequencies. So they're all going to get slightly different amounts of phase also. So they end up being out of phase. I mean, the same deposition. The same yeah, for ISO Z, yeah, so you can see it right here. ISO Z, they're all pointed in the exact same direction. But if I go 100 microns up, they're pointed this way. And another 100 microns up, they're pointed this way. And my slices tend to be finite thickness, right, millimeters. And I have a gradient over those millimeters. They're all at different frequencies. They're all going to be zones of slightly mm -hmm. different. The phase thickness is between the different distances. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And that's actually important to appreciate, right, that the phase dispersion that you're seeing here is across the thickness of the slice. The phase is one thing at the top of the slice, it's another thing at the middle of the slice, and it's something else at the bottom of the slice. But as we receive signal just from the slice, we need all of it to be in phase, ideally. Really good questions. We could just do this for the next hour, just expand on this movement. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about excitation pulses. We saw this going back, 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 like second lecture probably, right? We said that our B1, is, uh, our B1 fields that we apply are a function of time, and they're governed by some envelope function, but they're also, we know, rotating, right? That means that the B1 field is chasing the magnetization as, it, as it's processing around, right? This is what we call a circularly polarized RF field, and that's how we did describe it in the laboratory frame. Um, in principle, we don't actually care about these terms per se, right? They're just, they're there because the spins are processing in the laboratory frame. We need a B1 field in the laboratory frame, but we really just want to think about the rotating frame. And in the rotating frame, we can choose, say, a specific B1 envelope function, and it might be a sync pulse, for example. The sync pulse is shown below here. Uh, the envelope function itself is just the orange part of the sync pulse, right? It just maps out some, you know, what we call an envelope function, right? Inside of that envelope function, though, is the high frequency oscillations, even much higher than what I'm showing you here, which is the carrier frequency or the larmer frequency. So the whole RF pulse is really synthesized to generate this white oscillation. But the oscillations, in fact, are even 100 fold more than this, right? Because we're at the megahertz range. And this RF pulse, uh, its duration is only going to be maybe a couple of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds or something like that. But conceptually, in the laboratory frame, we have generate a B1 field that's following the white area. Uh, we saw this much earlier. It was a question about how would we calculate our flip angle. Uh, we want to talk about how much we can excite the spins. Um, you 
you had a homework problem on this as well. Uh, the flip angle that you generate just depends on the, on the time uh, integral of the B1 envelope function. Lots of different ways to choose your envelope function. We'll see if we get there today, but we'll talk some about sync functions and Gauss functions and things like this. Sync functions end up being really nice uh, functions that, uh, that we typically would want to use. Uh, if we're trying to figure out what alpha to use, uh, or, or rather trying to figure out what B1 uh, we need, we would define our flip angle. That's usually a target for us. We need it to be 10 degrees. We need it to be 30 degrees. And then we know something about the maximum B1 we can achieve. Then we just have to define how long we have to integrate this function to achieve the flip angle that we actually want. If the B1 field is applied for longer, then we just get more and more and more and more flip angle, especially in the case of a uh, box function or a recognition function. Uh, so excitation pulses, what do they do? Well, we know they tip the transverse, the MZ magnetization of the transverse plane. We can do it quickly, a couple hundred microseconds, maybe a few milliseconds. They can, in fact, be non-uniform across the slice thickness, right? Uh, meaning that the flip angle that you get, you might prescribe it, you might want it to be 90 degrees, but it doesn't mean you get 90 degrees through the slice thickness. Just like we saw phase differences across the slice thickness, you can also get amplitude differences across the slice. And whether or not that's important to you depends on exactly what you're trying to measure, but good to recognize. Uh, we call it having an imperfect slice profile. And in fact, we can never get a perfect slice profile. Right? Perfect is expensive, so we come close, but we're never perfect. We can also be non-uniform within the slice, right? So we want it to be 90 degrees throughout the entire object, but as a consequence of the object that we're imaging and the B1 coil's design, we might not get the, the same flip angle across the slice. So we can be non-uniform in sort of all dimensions, if you will. We call that B1 inhomogeneity. Okay, and we've seen this probably plenty of times. Different flip angles, or different possible flip angles, 90 degrees and short. So how does this all sort of come together in the context of slice selective excitation? Well, um, what we principally need to do is apply a radio frequency pulse. In this case, it's a sync pulse. And we can do, we can excite different slices, right? We can turn on an X gradient and consequently excite just an X slice or something in the YZ plane. We can do the same with the other directions as well, right? We can turn on a Y gradient, we can turn on a Z gradient and excite these different slices. So it all depends on what gradients are applied uh, as to what slice you'll actually excite. We could use the same RF pulse, right? The same RF pulse, but different gradients will give us completely different slices that we excite. Because it's all about the frequency content of this slice and where those frequencies found in your object depend on the applied gradient, right? So it's easy for us to excite arbitrary slices as well because we can turn on linear combinations of X, Y, and Z. And we can rotate our slice around to be anywhere in that. Uh, this is just reminding us of some of our gradient mathematics. We said the B field generated by a gradient always points along Z, but might be a function of X. It could be a function of Y. It could be a function of Z. If it's going to be a function of those things, then we say it's an X gradient, a Y gradient, or a Z gradient, and it depends on your X position, your Y position, your Z position. There can be some confusion sometimes because uh, mathematically it's handy or convenient to talk about sort of X, Y's, and Z's. Uh, in the imaging, uh, uh, sorry, in case space or in thinking through the uh, uh, spatial frequency encoding steps, sometimes we want to talk about frequency encoding, phase encoding, and slice selection. If there's a convention, it's usually the case that the Z gradient is used for slice selection, the X gradient is used for frequency encoding, and the Y gradient is used for phase encoding. Where it gets confusing is that we have lots of coordinate systems, lab frame, rotating frame, and then we have some arbitrary imaging slice that no longer corresponds to the X, Y, and Z axes, but it still corresponds to a frequency phase and slice select axes. So you have to be a little bit careful there sometimes. Okay, so we can talk about applying gradients in the presence of B0 fields. We know that our gradient fields only point along X, and we can compactly write the total applied gradient field just as being a G vector with some amplitude that gives M on and off as a function of time dotted with some spatial position, and that gives us the B field at a particular uh, uh, place. We can turn these B fields on and off as a function of time, and we may uh, may or may not have the, uh, well, we have the presence of the B0 field, and then we can say that the total field that's generated is the B0 field plus the gradient field at a particular energy space. Okay, so this we've seen at least conceptually, uh, or we've talked about it some before, 
the idea is that in the presence of a gradient, we can have our B field vary as a function of Z. No surprise. So our B field will just be zero at ISO center, and it can increase as we go to higher Z positions, or it can decrease as we go to lower Z positions. Uh, through just the basic Larmor relationship, then we know that our omega will be omega zero at ISO center, and we can increase our omega as we go out to higher Z positions, or we can slightly decrease our omega as we go out to negative Z positions. So we recognize that gradients uh, create a direct correspondence between frequency and spatial position. And that's a, that's a sort of fundamental connection that we need to understand or, or, or conceptualize for a model. Frequency and spatial position are linked through the applied gradient actually being used. So let's think about uh, some, some uh, details of these RF pulses that we have to use for exciting. Uh, if we turn on a gradient, right, so this, this uh, purple line here just means I've turned on some gradient. And in doing so, I'm mapping some frequency to some spatial position. Higher spatial positions are going to have higher frequencies. So higher spatial frequency, uh, sorry, higher spatial frequencies, higher spatial positions can be higher and higher uh, frequencies, right? So let's think about the RF pulse that I'm applying. The RF pulse has to have some nominal, what we call center frequency, right? That's usually going to be something close to omega zero, right? It has to have that carrier frequency that's close to the Larmor frequency. So here I say that the frequency of my RF pulse is maybe centered here at some particular value, something like 64 megahertz. But I don't usually use just a pure 64 megahertz signal. It's usually that plus a range of frequencies. The reason being that if I excite a range of frequencies with my RF pulse, that will apply to a range of positions depending on the strength of my applied gradient. Right? So here I have the, what we call the excitation bandwidth. Depends on the, the excitation bandwidth is delta omega. How much delta omega you want really depends on how much delta z you want to excite. Right? If I have a high bandwidth pulse, I can potentially excite a big you know, slab of, of material. If I have a really uh, uh, narrower frequency difference in my pulse, then I'll have a narrower z selection. So let's just compare two examples here, right? So on the right-hand side here, I've turned on a steeper, uh, or a stronger, rather, magnetic field gradient. If I have a stronger gradient turned on, then, or you know, every you know, few centimeters I go out, I have even higher frequencies than I would for the lower uh, applied gradient. If, however, I keep my RF frequency the same, so my RF frequency hasn't changed its center frequency, and I haven't changed the excitation bandwidth, then when I turn on a higher or steeper magnetic field gradient, I'll actually excite a different slice. Right? and a different thickness of the slice. So there's a trade-off here between what's the excitation bandwidth of my RF pulse, what's the applied magnetic field gradient that I'm using, and what slice I'm actually able to ultimately excite. Now, in principle, we want you know, reasonably thin slices. These are certainly not uh, good examples, right? We're exciting the entire heavy net. Um, but uh, you should appreciate sort of the, the difference that steepening the gradient has on the RF pulse CPU the gradient has on the slice that will actually end up exciting. So a couple of things we can think about, right? So let's say I, I'm exciting a slice. If I choose uh, omega RF to be the Larmor frequency, where is my excited slice? What's my excited slice going to go through? Okay. It's always going to go through isocenter in that case, right? So then how do I move my slice to a different spatial location? If I want to move my slice, let's say isocenter sort of through the middle of my how do, what do I have to change about my RF pulse if I want to excite something in the head? Increase the frequency of RF. Yeah, so one way would be increase omega RF, right? If this goes up higher here, then it's going to map out on this gradient further over here and excite a slice that's over in this next guy, right? Yeah, all, <laughs> yeah also, also possible. I could grab him by his ankles <laughs> and I could pull him down over here. So it's good, it's creative. Uh, so yes, also possible, right? Uh, but what I want you to be thinking about rather is, is how we, what happens when we change the, the omega RF, right? Uh, as a way of sliding the slice sort of up and down within the subject. And that has to be done sort of with respect to the applied gradient field. Okay, so when you sit down on the scanner, Vahid's actually right, oftentimes uh, you'll have some what we call scout image. You'll have some image that looks something like this. You'll say, oh, I want to get this image. Well, the scanner is smart enough to say, well, if that's the image you want, I'm going to move it to ISO center 
because that's the best place to acquire an adjacent random sample. And so then the table will move. So that's the first thing that happens. Sometimes, however, you want to get many, many slices as part of an experiment without moving the subject. Everything's registered, everything kind of works well together. It's maybe quicker even. But in that case, you'll have to say tune the RF pulse to slide the slices up and down through the time frame. We don't do that, and so it happens kind of seamlessly. Yep? Um, so to clarify, you can change both the RF frequency and the delta to the frequency? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about this sort of, you know, a little bit more as we go, but the idea is that Omega RF is just, let me go all the way back, Omega RF has to do with uh, the, the white uh, signal inclusion, right? So Omega RF is just the carrier frequency, and I can tune that by 1,000 hertz or 10,000 hertz and slide it around uh, in the presence of that gradient in particular. The, the, uh, the bandwidth, the excitation bandwidth of the pulse is related more closely to the envelope the envelope function that we choose will have a specific bandwidth. And we can change the bandwidth of our RF pulses to be either really high bandwidth uh, pulses or relatively low bandwidth pulses. Uh, high bandwidth pulses are, uh, are expensive, uh, meaning they tend to be long in time, and so that's not always a good choice. Good question. So, so I think what you're asking is why can't all RF pulses just have a V1 envelope that's just a box function, yeah. right? So the frequency content of that pulse is, is, is not very broad, right? And so you basically have like a single frequency, and so you could excite, uh, if you don't have a gradient term, they're useful pulses. So let's think about an RF pulse that's a single carrier frequency, and it's just turned on, and then it's turned off, right? When would that be useful? Well, if I don't turn a gradient on and my subject object is in the scanner, I can play that RF pulse and I should excite pretty much everything. Because pretty much everything is going to be at the normal frequency. And those pulses I can turn on, I don't have to turn them on for very long. High amplitude, short duration, I can excite sort of everything. More typically, what we want to do though is excite just a thin slice. And now I have to have only a narrow range of frequencies in that RF pulse to excite just that slice. Yeah, and in fact, if you just add up the add up the frequencies that you need, you'll get something that looks sync-like. So just the narrow range of frequencies that we want ends up being a sync-like function. And we'll actually see that. I know we won't get to it today, but uh, when we work through what's called the small tip angle approximation, you'll see this relationship maybe later. Yep. Yep. And if you have a bandwidth of some frequency of the eye, we just apply the RF pulse one by one at the same time. If you have a series of frequency of RF pulse. Um, no, I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. We only have one V1 coil. We only control like one current to that okay. coil. And it's all about how we how we modulate that current as a function of time. Yes, we, uh, if you have several uh, RF uh, frequency. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, yeah, it's at, it's basically at the same time, right? But you're not you're not applying each of the individual frequencies. You're applying the sum of all those frequencies, which gives you something that looks like that envelope function I was just showing you. So the the clock that runs the the current that runs the amp that runs the coil is just oscillating at 64 megahertz. And basically, all you can do is you can change that frequency. So we have it here, right? What can we change? Well, we can change the carrier frequency basic frequency. The other thing we can do is change the envelope function, right? What is the envelope function? Well, the envelope function changes the magnitude of the current as I'm oscillating. Am I oscillating a big current through, or am I going through a small current, and then a big current, and then a small current? Those sync functions have an envelope that looks like a sync function on them. That imparts a specific range of frequencies on your RF pulse. 
So that RF pulse that has a sync-like envelope function will have a particular center frequency as well as having a very specific excitation bandwidth. The shape of that pulse is what governs the excitation bandwidth. So we just play it as one thing. Okay. So what factors control the slice selection? Well, we can control that envelope function. It's not clear yet how you choose your envelope function. I'm going to show you probably next Tuesday that there's a Fourier transform relationship between our P1 envelope function and the slice profile that we accept. And that ends up being a really useful thing because otherwise our pulse design is really complicated. We can change the center frequency that helps us move, say, the slice around, but it also depends on the applied gradient amplitude that we're using. And we saw some, some relationships between gradient amplitudes and R frequencies and uh, excitation bandwidth. Okay. Um, what we haven't had a chance to talk about yet is sort of how this mathematically really comes together. Uh, so what we need to think about today, uh, this will probably be one of the last things we're able to get to, is back to forced precession. We're talking about excitation after all. But we also said excitation for slice selection involves the application of a gradient as well. So we need to think about forced precession with the application of a gradient, right? So what does that look like? Well, we've got to go back a few lectures and remember the equation of motion. We won't worry about relaxation because we're talking about short events during forced precession. So what we have to do is define our B effective. Well, interestingly now, our, our B effective is going to depend on space and time. Why? Well, we have a B1 field that we're using to force the magnetization to do something, and that's a function of time. But we also have our B0 field that's always present. But now we have the application of a gradient field, right? So we have a GZ gradient, and then the field effect depends on the spatial position. And when we talk about B effective, we always have this fictitious field in here that we would add in so it would put us into the rotating frame and we could effectively not sweat or worry about the effects of the B0 field and so on. Okay? So that's what our B effective field looks like. That B effective field has to come back into our equation of motion and it ends up giving us something that we'll see shortly is a little bit complicated, right? So we know that we have our, our time derivatives of each of the vector components. We map out our i, j, k, we map out our mx, m, y, and z, and now we look at what is our B effective uh, on, on, uh, uh, field. Uh, and it just comes from, uh, from this vector here. We have an x component, an i component rather, that falls in here. We have uh, a zero component in the middle, and then the B zero and the omega RF by gamma should cancel out if your RF uh, pulse is on resonance at B zero. And so then you just have a GZ uh, pulling into here, of course, with gammas. So we're consistent with the uh, equation of motion. If you multiply these things out, or actually at this point it's just a substitution, right? We're going to say, let's talk about omega 1 just as being the precessional frequency from the B1 field. And we're going to talk about omega as a function of z as being the, uh, the precessional frequency that comes from the gradient field. Okay. So I think the next thing we'll do is we'll actually work at breaking down this expression here. What you'll see, unfortunately, is we end up with a coupled system with differential equations. And so we have a system of equations that we can't work out solutions to by hand, uh, which of course is what we would what we would like to be able to do, but it's not always possible, right? Uh, that gets expansive, so you go to the right. Let me just remind myself of because we didn't exactly do this before, what's our B effective uh, uh, when we just have a gradient? So with, with So what does that mean? Well, we have some B field, and it's equal to the applied field when we have the application of a gradient is just our B0 field. Plus, let's keep it simple and just use one particular gradient, the GZ gradient, dotted with our Z position, gives us our total field, and of course everything points along the K direction. So that's our laboratory frame field. Let's talk about the B effective. What's the, the effective uh, magnetic field when we're in the rotating frame? 
uh, we have something very similar, right? We have E0 still. We still have plus the GZ and positive Z. But now we introduce that fictitious field. Uh, and if everything is on resonance, uh, then there's some terms that will cancel out. And so all this means is this first term here and this last term here for an on resonance system, the RF poles tuned to the V0 alarmer frequency, we'll just end up with uh, a simple dependence of GZ dotted with Z along the pole. And again, that's going to be for We won't take the time in this class to talk about sort of off-resonance possibilities. There is some text in the latter of a book if you want to dig into it. So what's the, what's the point of drawing this out? Well, the main point is to notice that your B effective is a function of space. Right? When we turn on a gradient, your B effective becomes a function of space. So we can draw that out. What does that, what does that look like? So what's my B effective if I'm at isocenter? And if I move a little bit away from isocenter, then I have a larger B effective. And if I move even further away from isocenter, then I have an even larger B effective. Just trying to map out graphically what does B effective look like, right? I can go in the opposite direction as well, and I'll have a minus B effective. And then the last one you pick up is it's going to maybe go off the charts, right? So why is that interesting? Well, it tells you right away that, the, that your B effective changes in, as a function of space, right? How the, the magnitude of that field depends on where we are in space. Not terribly interesting all by itself. What we have to do next is think about, well, what's our B effective in the presence of a gradient, but also with the B1 field? That gets us to a, a, a more interesting condition, right? So let's think that through. So we have uh, B effective with B1 and B1. So again, we write down our B field, we say our B field those circumstances looks like V0 plus a field term, a gradient term either GZ dot Z. Uh, those two terms point along K, of course. But our B1 field, uh, we'll choose a simple B1 field, but our B1 field might point just along the I direction. Right? So now we have two components to our possible B field here. Uh, remembering that the B1 field is always perpendicular to the V0 field. So what's our B effective look like? Well, we have our B effective field is going to take into account that fictitious field. And so we just have something like E0 plus G Z dot Z minus uh, omega RF. Along the K direction uh, plus B1 along the I direction. And the picture that you want to have in your mind is that there's some, uh, we're talking about the simultaneous application of a B1 pulse uh, with a gradient. And it doesn't really matter what the B1 pulse looks like right now, let's just say we turn it on and we turn it off. Or maybe we do the same thing for our gradient, we turn it on and we turn it off. This is our G Z gradient. Uh, obviously, we have some terms that cancel there uh, for on resonance uh, RF pulses. And we just end up similar to what we had just a second ago. We have our GZ dotted with our Z position uh, along the K hat direction. But now there's a new term which comes from our B1 field. And we have B1 uh, with our I hat uh, direction. Uh, B1 acting along the I hat direction. And again, this is just right now, we're only worried about for on resonance. 
So we can do the same thing again. We can draw out what our B1 effective field looks like under slightly different conditions. So I'll, I'll draw one in the middle here. Just drawing my XYZ axis. Uh, so if, for this case here, this is the Z equals zero case. So for z equals zero, I don't have any gradient uh, 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 component to my b effective. I just have my b1 field, and it's going to point along my uh, i hat direction. So b effective uh, at isocenter just points along the x direction. So what does that mean? Well, it means that at isocenter, for the condition that we described, at isocenter, we have B effective perfectly in the transverse plane, right? It's only in the I hat direction at this point. It could be anywhere in the transverse plane, but we simplified the VR full to be able to do it there. So what's the other possibility? Well, let's look at another spatial position, right? So now we talk about X, Y, and Z. Now, if we're going to, you know, we're going to say this is uh, z equal to, uh, I guess I'll do z1, just some arbitrary non-zero and positive spatial position, right? So now I have two things, right? I still have my b1 pointing along the i hat direction. I have that component. Uh, so this is my b, just my b1 field. But I don't just have a b1 field. I also have this gz field. So now pointing in the z direction, I have to have some additional b field to be connected. So this would be my g, z, so I'll have the z component of my field, not z1 in particular. What does that mean? Well, it means that my b effective actually points out along some diagonal. Right? The vector sum of my gradient field and my b1 field is now out of the transverse plane. Where is it going to point as my GZ gets really, really strong or my spatial position gets really, really large? What's an RF pulse going to do for really large Z positions or really large GZs? What's the B effective going to do? Is it going to produce any transverse magnetization? No, right? Because all of a sudden it's handed the, it's, it's a vector is pointing, say, along K. K won't excite my spins anymore, right? It has to have an I or J component to tip the magnetization into the transverse plane. Okay? So an RF pulse in the presence of a gradient can only excite a range of spins. It can't just excite all spins. We can look at the other sort of example just to sort of you know, draw the same or similar conclusion. So now we map out, say, x axis and y axis. So now we choose, say, z equal to minus z1. Right? We still have the same b effective, or sorry, the same b1, right? So my b1 should still point along my i direction here. So this is my b1 on the i hat direction. Now I have a GZ component that's going to point down. So this is my minus, say, minus GZ dotted with B1. And my net field is going to point down just this way. And so that's my B effect. Why does that why does that matter? Well again what it's saying is that with the application of a simultaneous B1 field and a gradient field, I can only excite spins somewhere near, uh, say, isocenter, right? If I tune my radio frequency pulse to be different from B0, then I can actually move this around. But in the limits of Z being really, really big or my gradient being really, really strong, I'll have no effective B field capable of exciting spins. It's not that the B effective field goes to zero. It's its directionality is no longer in the transverse plane. Right? We had to have B1 pulses in the IJ plane 
to have the effect of excitation. As I get further away, that B field is tilting upwards, and I'm no longer able to excite my spins. I'm just adding to their precession, right? I'm adding to the B0, if you will. So this eventually just becomes, say, a minus K or a plus K oriented. So I think there's probably a couple slides, and then uh, next time when we come back, we'll, we'll work on what's called the small tip angle approximation. Sorry. Questions about where we landed? The main thing was recognizing how to come up with the B effective, right? And then what's all I was trying to show you right now is what's, what is the B effective gives us some insight to slice selection, right? That the application of a B1 pulse and a gradient pulse should only allow us to excite some range of spins rather than all possible spins. It's just a few slides. Okay, so a reasonable question to ask. What's the ideal slice profile, right? We talked about how when we image slices, it might be non-uniform in the slice, and it can be non-uniform sort of through the slice. But what's the ideal slice profile? Slice profile is sort of the shape of excitation through the slice. What's that? Almost the same magnitude, the same magnitude of Yeah, yeah, I want the same magnetization everywhere. Right? That would be ideal. So that'd be like a rect function, right? I want all of my magnetization to be uniformly excited. That's not easy, right? Changing the shape of the envelope function, function uh, pulse ex affects the excitation bandwidth. That's not an obvious thing, uh, but we said it before. We can modulate the excitation bandwidth, the delta omega, by our choice in the envelope function itself. The question is, how do you even know what shape to use, right? How do you pick an envelope function? How do you pick a sync function? And what, how much, you know, sync functions go for infinity, so how much of a sync function? What about a Gauss function? What about a hyperpolar or hyperbolic secant function? There's choices, right? It's difficult to, to know what to pick until you appreciate what's called the small tip angle approximation. And there, what we'll learn, and we won't do this today, but what we'll learn is that the slice profile depends on the Fourier transform of uh, the envelope function. So we can actually do a pretty good job of designing our slice profile uh, just through a, a Fourier transform. So let's say this is our uh, the B1 pulse that we choose. It's a sync-like function. It's not a true sync. A true sync goes plus minus infinity. So this is a truncated sync pulse, right? If I use this pulse in combination with the gradient, my slice profile will look something like this. What's the slice profile? It's the transverse magnetization that we've generated as a function of, say, slice thickness, right? Across the slice. And I will have excited a lot of spins. Almost everything is excited. Maybe this is my M naught, almost full magnetization. But the slice profile has some funny ripples in it, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll get much more into the details uh, Tuesday, I guess, about uh, what it means to have an imperfect slice profile and, and how we could uh, approach getting an even better and better slice profile. So, yeah. so that when we come back, we'll talk about the small tip angle approximation. We would like to have perfect rect functions, right? Just perfect excitation, evenly through the slice. We don't get that. One of the reasons we don't get that is because uh, we would have to have an infinitely long sync pulse, and that would take a long time to apply. Short story. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about uh, excitation. Um, hopefully, Patrick is going to be here. I think we're wrapping up a little on the early bit, so it's good. Uh, he said, hey, send me a text. Walking over now. Tell them to hang tight if they want the uh, so he's walking over. Uh, if you sit tight, you can grab that. I'm here for questions. Otherwise, see you Tuesday. So this example is